Hey guys, Metal Jesus here, and I am back with a highlights video of my recent trip to Japan for 11 days. On this trip, we go to Tokyo, Osaka, and also Kyoto, taking in a bunch of local culture, eating a ton of great Japanese food, going to arcades, and of course, lots and lots of game hunting. And like I mentioned, this is the first video of two. Now the second video will come out just a couple days after this one. So without further ado, let's get started. All right, the day has finally arrived for us to go to Japan and my wife and I are rushing to the airport to meet up with Kinsey and her boyfriend, Tony. So what's the plan for today? So today we are flying to Tokyo. Yay! We're so excited. We have the tiniest of tiny layovers in Portland. <laughs> Yeah. And then once we land in Tokyo, we hop a train to Ueno, find our Airbnb, and then my first stop is to get some takoyaki. That's my whole goal for the day. I don't know what takoyaki is, but <laughs> I, I want some. You do. So now I settle in for a long, long flight. We're gonna head down to Portland real quick, and then from there, pick up some more passengers, and then we are on our way crossing the Pacific Ocean to Japan. And it's a long 10 hour flight. And oh my gosh. You know, I'm a big guy, I'm six foot four, so sitting in coach for that long is pretty brutal, but we're very excited once we approach the island. Now I said Tokyo Airport, but technically we landed at Narita International Airport, which is almost an hour outside of Tokyo. So the very first thing that you need to do is get on a train and travel into the city. And this is a theme that you're gonna see throughout our travels in Japan because we use a lot of public transit to get around. Once we get inside Tokyo, the next step is to get to the Airbnb. And I have to say, I am super glad that we traveled with Kinsey because she's been studying Japanese for several years now. She's been to Japan before and she was hugely, hugely helpful in making this whole trip just very seamless. I mentioned the Airbnb because one of our goals for this trip was to try to do it as cheaply as possible. It can be very expensive to get to Japan and we wanted to be smart about it. And so this Airbnb only cost us $60 a night per person. That's really cheap for Tokyo. Now it's not the nicest place. It's not a four star hotel, but we're not gonna be there that much. We are all about exploring the city and having fun in Japan. And so this was perfect for us. It was in a great location. It was safe, it was clean. Yeah, we were, we were excited. So you've been here like what, half an hour? And what'd you find? Beer vending machine. <laughs> Which How one old you? are you? <laughs> oh yeah. Old enough. <laughs> yeah. I love nice. It. When people talk about Japan, they always mention the vending machines and they are right. They are everywhere. They're super convenient. You can get pretty much everything you need. I think we need to have these in the U.S. We are at a takoyaki stand, which is octopus dumplings. And we're in Ameyoko and so many YouTubers have gone here and they look like the best octopus balls ever. Yep, we are jumping right into exploring Tokyo. And keep in mind, this is after a long 10 hour flight and Japan is 16 hours ahead of Seattle. Oh man, I didn't know what was going on, but I was having a blast. It didn't take long for Kinsey to recommend that we check out a local game store. And the first one we stumbled into was Hard Off, which I believe is part of Book Off. This is a chain of stores that sells nothing but used merchandise. And so this is my very first experience walking into a Japanese game store. And right away, you see that there's just a little of everything. It's kind of amazing. A lot of these stores in Tokyo are very vertical. So depending on what floor you visit, you'll see different merchandise. For instance, here you see a bunch of electronics equipment and also musical equipment. And the first thing you notice right off the bat is that almost everything is sealed with cellophane, almost like they're brand new. This is a brilliant concept because everything stays very dust free, very new looking. For this first store, I didn't really buy much. Honestly, I was really jet lagged and really just trying to take it all in and kind of see what's out there. But don't worry. Oh, yeah, I'm going to go nuts buying stuff here pretty soon. Mega games already. 
All right. Well, that's a good start to our Japan trip. But tomorrow we're going to hit it hard. So we're going to head back to Airbnb and try to get some sleep. We're at Lawson, which is a convenience store chain here in Japan, and it's awesome. <laughs> and they have the strawberry. <laughs> I don't know if you know this about Japan yet, but their convenience stores are legendary. They're nothing like how we have in the United States because, yes, you have all the cheap stuff, the food that you probably shouldn't be eating but they also have amazing fresh food and deli sections that frankly are really legit. I mean, you will see Michelin star quality food in convenience stores. And so we're a little bit early. Most of the stores that we wanna to go to just yet are not quite open. So we decided to go to Lawson's here and get a bunch of food and then head to the park and check it out. Ueno Park is kind of amazing because it's this huge park in the middle of Tokyo. Tokyo is this massive city of 13 million people and you can just wander into this park and see a bunch of nature and water. And of course it made a great spot to have some breakfast. Japan has a lot of video game culture. And so right off the bat, Kinsey spotted some mochi in the shape of Kirby and couldn't help herself, but tore right into him. All right, we got some food in us. We're well rested. Now it's time to head over to Akihabara. Now, Akihabara, for those that are video game nuts like me, well, you know this area because it is world famous. You can find video games here, anime, manga, computer stuff, so much more. And I have to say, it was a little overwhelming. So thankfully, Kinsey had planned our entire day out. And one of the first places that she wanted to hit up was called SoftMap. And yet again, I am blown away when I walk in here because I see a wall of PlayStation Vita games. It's so amazing to see so many games released for a system that's basically considered to be a failure in North America, but not in Japan. I also start noticing on the top of all these aisles are all of these collector and special editions that I don't think we ever got in the US. It's at this point when I start thinking about my friends back in the States who might be interested in some of this stuff. And I bust out my phone, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go ahead and text them. I'm like, oh, wait, we are 16 hours ahead of those guys. So I have to start thinking about the time difference when I'm messaging, like say Reggie to ask him if he's interested in one of these special editions. It's, it's kind of weird to be that far ahead in the future. It takes a little bit of time, you know, you have to get used to that. I definitely like SoftMap quite a bit. It was a cool start to our game hunting day. The store tends to lean, at least it feels to me, a little bit on the newer side of stuff. So if you're looking for a PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4 exclusives and limited editions, this is a great store for that. All right, so first game store we walk in, well, I guess second, whatever. First one of the day. And I got the Dragon Quest Slime Ooh, 2DS. That is cool. Ooh, and it's even, a little slimy on the inside. It's adorable. I had to get it. How, do, how are you showing it right now? All right, and then I also got, and the reason I got this, because one of my favorite series, way more games came out in Japan. So this is Rocket Slime 3, and I love Rocket Slime. I also got Mario Basketball, because the cover's awesome. <laughs> What'd you get? I got, an Evangelion game for the PS2. I got what I think is the first or precursor to the EDF games. Um, and I got Big Box PC. Those are so cool. I got Ease One, complete. Ease Two, complete. And Ease Eternal. All for how much, well, and those were cheap. Super cheap. <laughs> Excellent. Good score. We've only just begun, and the next place that Kinsey recommends we check out is called Surugaya, which is also in Akihabara. 
So many of these places are just within walking distance. It's awesome. This store sells a bunch of stuff, including vinyl figures and stuff like that. But down in the basement, in the underground area is where all of the good stuff is. Now, this is one of the first stores where I really started to feel a bit claustrophobic. Again, remember that I am a big guy. I'm six foot four and yeah, a little overweight and I could barely fit down some of these aisles. It was pretty funny, but man, I am determined. I am on a mission. I will find video games. I also have to apologize. I'm looking a little rough here because, well, I am very jet lagged, but nothing's gonna stop me. I'm buying that. When it comes to handhelds, Japan got a bunch of colored variants, especially for the PSP and the Vita. So I've been on the lookout for several of them. The day is young with so many video game stores yet to explore, but we're starting to get a little bit hungry and I love ramen. So Kinsey has hunted down a great ramen place in Akihabara. And this is another place where I felt like a freaking giant. I mean, this was a ramen place that probably seated maybe 10 people total. And <laughs> I mean, I barely fit on the stool. They actually had to bring in another sleeve for the table so that we could all fit around it. But as you can see from these photos, the ramen was legit. Oh my gosh. It was so worth the uncomfortable seating to eat this amazing ramen. Not far from the ramen restaurant is another Surigaya gaming store, so we had to check it out. Now this store was definitely packed from the floor to the ceiling in a very, very small space, but the stuff you would find in here was pretty cool, including these arcade boards these immediately caught Tony's eye because he's a big arcade board collector. I also found some big box PC games. Now this is something that you can sometimes find at Japanese game stores, but they're definitely hit and miss and they're almost always towards the floor, almost like most people don't care about them, but I certainly do. This particular visit actually was fairly short because we knew we we're gonna come back in a couple days. See, this store is right next to another famous Japanese store called Beep. And Beep, unfortunately on this day, was closed. So we knew we we're gonna come back. So this particular run through of the store was just really quick. We're at Sudugaya, and okay. we just stopped in quickly, but even in the small amount of time, got pop and music controller, Animal Crossing for less than a dollar. Ooh. Sorry. Ooh. Two copies of the Sailor Moon fighting game on the 3DO. Very cool. Evangelion on Sega Saturn. And then one more thing. Surprise, surprise, Sailor Moon. <laughs> it's at this point that we took a train back to the Airbnb to drop some stuff off and kind of relax a little bit because we had a long night ahead of us. And once we were all rested, well, we were back out on the town. Everybody who talks about retro gaming in Tokyo always mentions Super Potato and yes, we are going to check it out. So the thing about Super Potato, I recognize almost immediately after walking around for a bit, is that it kind of felt sort of familiar. And that is because it really reminds me of Pink Gorilla Games in Seattle. That's the store that Kelsey is a co-owner of. As a matter of fact, I got my phone out and I messaged her and I sent her some photos. I'm like, this feels like Pink Gorilla. And she responded to me, she's like, yeah, that's the original design or idea behind Pink Gorilla was to feel like Super Potato in Japan. And one thing I've noticed about almost all of these retro gaming stores is that they have just an amazing amount of merchandise jammed into these small spaces and it covers just about every generation of consoles. It's very impressive how much stuff they jam in here. It's, it's claustrophobic, <laughs> but it's also really cool because, you know, everywhere you look, you're just discovering something new and interesting. A fun little bonus to discover at Super Potato was at the top floor, a little mini arcade. So this is just, uh, operation is unconfirmed. So just untested, no controller, no anything, but it was only 780 yen. That's so, Super Potato. Worth it. <laughs> it's day three and uh, 
jet lag is still kicking our butt. That 16 hour time difference is brutal. It takes a while to really get used to that. Uh, today we're going to Asakusa. And so there's like a big shopping street. We can see Tokyo Sky Tree. And there's also the Asasi, Asasi, Asahi Beer Tower. <laughs> Yummy. So we'll be doing that. It's gonna be fun. Beer. That's right. For today, Kinsey has planned for us to take in a little bit of local Japanese culture. Can't always be about video games, can it? So the first stop is this open market street that is sitting next to a really cool temple. Now, I got to be honest with you guys, I don't know anything about Japanese temples, but it was cool to see because it was big, colorful, full of people, all this activity going on. It was definitely a really neat temple to check out. And then from there, we're able to walk a couple short blocks away over to the waterfront and then head up to the Asahi Beer Tower. And as you can see, it was just a perfect day for walking around Tokyo. As a matter of fact, this is a great time of year to go to Tokyo because it wasn't too hot, you know, and, and it also wasn't too cold. I mean, I actually took pants with me, but I didn't end up wearing them because I didn't need to. I had basically shorts on every single day. We are at Kuda Sushi, and it is kind of like a dollar conveyor belt sushi place that every five plates, because you put them in here, then you get to play a mini game and you might win a prize. Prize is more sushi. Prize is more sushi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone wins. Yeah, right. <laughs> Like Kinsey said, this is a conveyor belt style sushi place that is really inexpensive and pretty high quality. Not the best, but it was decent. And like she said, every five plates that you insert into the little slot there, you get a chance to win a prize. I've never experienced anything like this before and it was actually a lot of fun. Ta-da. Ooh, that looks good. Okay. Although we don't need to win more food, let's be honest. Come on, you got it. Come on, you can do it. Yeah! So it only took us buying 30 plates of sushi. <laughs> Was it worth it? Uh, I'll let you be the judge. What neighborhood is this? Shinjuku. Oh. It's cool. It's real cool. Now it's time for some Japanese insanity. Have you heard of the robot show and restaurant before? I had kind of heard of it, but this is something that Kinsey planned and she's like, you gotta do this at least once when you're in Japan. And she was so right. This is, this is bonkers. So this is, uh, <laughs> It's really funny, I'm sitting here recording this going, how do I describe the robot restaurant? It's crazy. Look at this toilet! This is how you are greeted when you walk in the door is all of this madness that goes on with this show. To be honest, it's actually designed for tourists and it's completely over the top. I'm not even really sure what it's about, but basically it's a show, it costs about 50 US dollars and it's very intimate. You can see right here that I'm actually on the front row and these people are performing right in front of me. It reminds me of a Vegas show, but also a rock and roll show. Maybe if you were on drugs or something, <laughs> it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty out there. The entire show is about 90 minutes long and it's broken up into different acts. And it's almost like they're traveling through time. There is definitely a story here and it's very inspired by Japanese culture and pop culture, manga, video games. As you can see by these footage here, like it's just insanity. It's, uh, it's crazy, you have to experience it because I've never seen anything quite like it. So that's gonna do it for part one and this video of my trip to Japan, but don't worry because I've got seven more days 
in Japan. So in the next video, I'm gonna go to Osaka, I'm also gonna go to Kyoto, and then we're gonna come back to Tokyo. And there is a lot more game hunting, a lot more of the culture of Japan. There's a lot more to show. And also in that second video, I'm gonna show you every single thing that I picked up. I haven't really covered in detail all of that in this video, because we just got to Japan, but in the next video, I'm gonna show you all 26 games that I picked up, as well as the three consoles. So you're definitely gonna watch that, and that's gonna come in just a couple days. Also, let me know if you have traveled to Japan. I would love to know what your thoughts are on going to Japan and what you thought of this video. Please post a comment down below. And as always, guys, I wanna thank you very much for watching my channel. Thank you for subscribing and take care. Hey guys, Metal Jesus here, and I am back again with part two of my epic trip to Japan. You are watching highlights from part one here. If you missed that, you're definitely gonna to wanna to watch that one first because I hit a bunch of game stores and we show a lot of cool stuff. I'll link to it in the video description below. But in part two, we're gonna to head to Osaka, then Kyoto, and then finally back to Tokyo. And all along the way, we're gonna take in some local culture, eat some tasty food, and do lots and lots of game hunting. And at the very end of this video, I'll show you everything I picked up. Let's take a look. It is day four of our Japan trip and we are checking out of our Airbnb. Now you're gonna notice that our group increased by two people and that is because two friends of Kinsey's joined us in Tokyo and their names are Mimo and Steph. The plan for today is to head to Tokyo Station and get on a bullet train to Osaka. Now these bullet trains can be kind of pricey, but if you get a JR pass, you can use these for an entire week. And since we're gonna be traveling around the country, it just made sense, it was worth it. Plus you end up spending less time traveling and more time exploring. This particular bullet train is not technically the fastest one, and so it's gonna take about three hours to get from Tokyo to Osaka. Now in my last video, a lot of people were asking me, what games did I bring to entertain myself both on the flight to Tokyo and also on these trains? And I thought in this video, I'd show you some of the Switch games that I decided to pack. And as you can see, it's pretty much every genre, depending on my mood and how jet lagged I am. But I have to say, it was really fun looking out the window. It was my first time on a bullet train and check this out. This app on my phone is showing that we're doing about 170 miles per hour. We were flying. It was really, really fun. Other perks of the bullet train is you get an assigned seat, which is really nice. Also, there's plenty of room, even for a guy like me, and you can eat your lunch. So before we hopped on the train, we got some really nice bento lunches here. Look at these things. They're like works of art and they weren't very expensive. Each one of those was $10 or less. And to say we were excited to start our second leg of our Japanese adventure would be an understatement. We arrived in Osaka in the afternoon and then immediately headed to Dotenbury Street and then walked through there to get to our next Airbnb. And Dotenbury Street is very cool, although it's very touristy, very busy. Now one side is a lot of shops, a lot of restaurants, a lot of just people and things to look at. And then the other side is really pretty because it's a canal. It is day five and what do I find right off the bat early in the morning is a gachapon store. This is an entire store dedicated to these little toy capsules. And I have to say, I don't know if I really get these things. I mean, I know they're kind of cheap and fun, I guess, but it just seems like cheap little toys. I don't know. And they are everywhere. It's funny because Kinsey just can't help herself. She actually bought several of them. For me, it's just more crap I'd have to haul home, so I kind of ignored it. But the stuff I do want to haul home, well, they're called video games. And we are headed to another Super Potato, not very far from where we just were. It's amazing how close all this stuff is. Now, maybe it's because of the location, but I definitely liked this one over the one in Tokyo. There was just so much more room. And I've mentioned that before. It's just that there are a lot of these stores where they can feel very claustrophobic. Well, this one is really big, incredibly varied. It's actually two different levels. And as you can see, there's no shortage of video games. It was, it was nuts. When I went upstairs, two things that really caught my eye, the first one being the Wonderswan games. Now, I know a lot of people in North America are not familiar with the Wonder Swans because 
I think it came out here, but it wasn't very popular. The reason why it caught my attention is because Kelsey is going for a complete collection. And so Japan is the place to do that. So I actually sent her a photo of the wall of Wonderswan games and she told me which ones to get. So that was really cool. And then there was a wall of Famicom disc games. Again, another format that really didn't come over to North America, but in Japan there are, I mean, it looks like there's hundreds of them. And so I sent a photo to, uh, to John Riggs because I knew he'd love that. For myself, I found a copy of Hotline Miami for the Vita, the physical version. I didn't even know that they made a physical version, so I definitely picked this up. And wouldn't you know it, just down the street is another Sewer Gaia store. Man, these things are everywhere. Again, this is an amazing chain of retro gaming stores. Walk in here and, you know, again, it's just like every other store in Japan. It's just overwhelming when you walk in. It's, it's pretty awesome. Check out these boxed Famicom and Super Famicoms here. Man, it's crazy. I want all of them. I don't I don't need them. I just want them. A couple surprises in this store was the Isle of Neo Geo stuff. Again, this is something that you just don't normally see in North America, but to see all of it just was laying here ready to be purchased is pretty wild. In their display case, they had a bunch of really cool special edition consoles. Most of them were out of my price range, but they were really neat to look at. And I always forget that Pac-Man is actually called Puck-Man in Japan. And check out that nose. It was here that I found an Xbox exclusive third person shooter called Muzzle Flash. I know nothing about it, but I picked it up. It was really cheap. As well as two Xbox 360 shooters. We are not done game hunting. Oh no, not by a long shot. We also just stumble into a place called A2. Now this place, <laughs> I know I keep saying I'm blown away, but man, again, I walk into these places and I'm just like blown away again and again. The first thing that really struck me about this place was just how many PSP games they had. They had so many PSP games in here that I've never heard of before, that I've never seen. I was on my phone going, what the heck is this? Can I play it not knowing Japanese? And uh, yeah, it was really, really fun to dig through here. They also had lots and lots of collector editions and special editions, everything from, again, the PSP, the Vita, the PlayStation 3, PlayStation 1, you name it, this place had it all. Again, I'll show you everything that I picked up at the end of this video. And then to top off our day, we wandered into this retro themed bar called Space Station. Check out these stairs, isn't that cool? And it was funny because the moment that we walked in here, a guy walked up to me and introduced himself. His name is Matthew and he's the owner of the bar and he watches my YouTube channel. And so that was like, whoa, you know, I'm thousands of miles from home and here is this guy who, you know, is a big fan of my channel, super nice guy. And this bar was really cool. As you can see from this footage, lots of places for you to, you know, have a drink, play some old games, look around the room and see a bunch of nostalgic game boxes. And it's he had little things everywhere in this bar. So if you are a retro gamer fan like me, you, you can definitely want to check out Space Station. And now I want to take a moment to talk about something that might make some of you cringe. You may have heard about Japanese toilets and how electronic they are, how computer driven they are, how amazing they are and i'm here to tell you it is all true these toilets have heated seats not a big deal but it's pretty cool they have two modes for flushing yeah other other toilets do that but they've also got a shower for your butt that's all i'm gonna say about that and they also have a bidet for the ladies they also have a button that will artificially make a flushing sound if you want to mask your own uh, your own business. Or some of them might even play a song if uh, let's say the guy next to you is a little bit too grunty. And I have to admit at first it was really weird. I don't know about you, but in my home we've got nothing like this. And uh, I decided to, you know, to, be open-minded and I gotta say actually <laughs> once you try these Japanese toilets 
you see the genius of them. I mean, we need to have these in the US. I'm serious. Day six is when we're gonna take a little bit of a side trip up to the city of Kyoto. Now, when you look at the map, it looks like it's actually kind of far, but it's really not actually. It doesn't take very long at all. And I have to say, when you get to Kyoto and you walk into that incredibly impressive train station, it takes your breath away. It's such a beautiful building. It's, I mean, you just wanna just explore it. It's amazing. It's in Kyoto where we slow down a little bit and take in some local culture a bit. I mean, again, it can't all be about video games. I know, call me crazy. One of the highlights for me this day was going to visit the Nishiki Market. Now this is a fresh food market that's in the center of Kyoto. What's crazy about this is that it's really narrow and it's like five blocks long and you just walk down this, seeing tons and tons of fresh seafood, fresh food, everything, fresh meat, fresh vegetables, it's crazy. Our hotel was really close to this shrine right here that you see on the screen. And I apologize, I actually don't know the names of these shrines. I know I'm kind of a bad tourist, but this was a really fun place because we met up as a group. And one thing that happened was Japanese school students would come up to foreigners like us and practice their English. And so they did that with Kinsey and Tony, and they were super polite, very excited to get some time with you as a foreigner. Uh, they would ask really cute questions like, what did you think about Japan? What were your favorite things that you saw? Uh, and then at the end, they would either want to take a photo with you or they would give you a little present. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> very sweet. It was, it was a really cool moment. The next morning, we explored a little bit further into the park that is next to that shrine. And we wandered into a part of Kyoto that is designed to be preserved as though it was a hundred years ago or maybe even older. And so you see a lot of houses and a lot of businesses in that very traditional Japanese style. And one of those businesses that I was very excited to explore and please don't laugh, that is the Starbucks that is in this traditional district. Why do you ask? Because, it, well, because it's stunningly beautiful. But as you can see here, you could easily walk past the Starbucks and not even know it's there. So it's actually built into a hundred year old wooden Japanese townhouse. And just, just walking in the door and seeing the little garden over to the right, and seeing the barista stations and then then you, you go in the back to pick up your drink and there's another garden there and then you go upstairs and the entire sitting area is broken into little rooms. It just has this feel and vibe that's, well, frankly, as you can see here, it's nothing like any other Starbucks you've ever been in. And so, you know, being from Seattle, I mean, I, I had to check this out. All right, that's our little overnight trip to Kyoto. We're gonna hop a train and go back to Osaka. Now, one of the things that we wanna check out while in Japan, specifically in Osaka, is some of their world famous okonomiyaki. Now, there is a restaurant in Osaka where people will stand in line for hours, perhaps, <laughs> to get a taste of this. And we decided, okay, we're gonna do it. And so once you get in there, a chef comes over to your table, which has this hot plate, and then starts mixing these ingredients together. Now, basically this is kind of like a Japanese pancake. It's got flour, eggs, shredded cabbage. It's got some sort of meat in there, uh, and then it's topped with all sorts of condiments. It looks really weird, but as it cooks and as that smell hits you, oh my gosh, this was really, really good. So good, as a matter of fact, we want to find a place in Seattle that makes it. It's so unique. Uh, it's definitely to be tried. After another day of travel back to Tokyo for the final leg of our tour, well, we were on a mission. And remember in the first video when I mentioned that we wanted to go to Beep? Well, that's on the agenda for today. Beep and a bunch of other stuff. And Beep did not disappoint. It's another one of these really small, really compact retro gaming stores in Tokyo. 
I mean, as you can see from this footage, it is from the floor to the ceiling, packed full of games, games, and just more games. Magical Chase for basically $1,780. Yeah, that's kind of pricey, but cheaper than the North America version. Now, there were a couple things that really stood out for me here. One of them was this aisle of big box PC games. Now, I didn't buy a ton because they are a little bit on the pricey side. I actually picked up an Amiga game, which was pretty cool. But uh, around the corner, I saw a copy of Time Zone. And if you are familiar with big box PC games and specifically Sierra, you know just how unusual it is to see a copy of that. I was like blown away. Now they're asking basically a thousand dollars for that, which that's a little high. Uh, it may actually be in really good condition, but I, I wasn't you know prepared to pay that, but it was really cool to see. They also had a bunch of old computers, not only just set up, but actually working and playable. And then right next door to Beep was that Surigaya store that we visited in the first video. But I knew I was gonna come back here because they have a copy of Moochie Moochie Pork for the Xbox 360. That is a Japan exclusive and I had to have it. They also had lots and lots of shoot 'em ups both for the Xbox 360 and the PSP. And I picked up a stack of them and I'll show you those at the end here. Uh, they're all kind of pricey, but What's kind of pricey? Thing, um, kind of pricey is they're all, well, this one's a hundred bucks. So it's actually on the fair or the low end of these. Because there's one you pick up and it's like, oh, it's $1,800. Okay. 18, yeah, 1800, <laughs> that's a lot. So I think this is the same one that I found. <laughs> I don't know what game that is, but that is a pretty epic collector's edition. That is so funny. One thing I haven't talked about that I know a lot of you are curious about is the arcade scene in Japan. And well, the things you've heard are absolutely true. The Japanese take arcades extremely seriously and it's very impressive. For one thing, most of them are actually multi-level, meaning that you'll have fighting games on one floor, shooters on another, rhythm games on another, uh, strategy games. It's insane how big these things are and they're very clean and well-maintained. You'll see employees walking around, dusting off the machines, cleaning the controllers, sweeping the floors. The entire places are just spotless. And everything looks new. I mean, these machines are heavily played, but even the monitors aren't faded. They're just, again, they're just like they're brand new. And while I didn't spend a ton of time in these places, it is part of the Japanese gaming culture and it's really fun to see. And at the end here, I wanna show you what we picked up. Now I'm gonna start with actually what Kinsey picked up. That's what you're looking at right here. And as you can see, she picked up a little of everything. I mean, she's got PlayStation games there, DS, 3DS games, Game Boy, N64, PS2. I mean, she kind of went crazy. And what she does actually, she collects for her personal self, for her personal collection, but then she also sells some of it at expos. And so you may actually see her at an expo this summer or this fall and on her table will be some of this. And she uses that to kind of help pay for the trip. But for me, I just buy what I wanna play. And not many people realize that there were a ton of awesome shooters released on the Xbox 360 that were exclusive to Japan and can be very expensive to import. And so I went completely nuts on the shooters over there. I, as you can see here, I bought a ton of them. Uh, most of these are actually from Cave, but not all of them. Here are some of the more hard to find shooters on the PSP. And what I love about this is that you don't have to know Japanese to enjoy these. I mentioned Muzzle Flash as a Japanese Xbox exclusive, but I also picked up Double Steel 1 and 2. Now we got Double Steel 1 as a game called Reckless The Yakuza Missions, but the second game actually only came out in Japan. And here are two PlayStation 4 games that I don't think we got as physical versions. So figured I'd pick these up as well. Silent Hill Zero was called Silent Hill Origins in North America. I think you can play Zero in English, but I'm not sure. 
Salamander Portable can be kind of expensive. Thankfully, I didn't have to pay that much for it. I previously mentioned Hotline Miami, the physical version for the Vita, and then I saw this fighting game here on the Switch. I might actually end up giving that to Reggie. I did end up picking up the Ultima 4 Quest for the Avatar. This is for the FM7, which is a Japanese computer that I do not own, but because it has the cloth map and also the Ankh, I felt it was worth it. We met up with Kinsey's friend named Kevin who gave me this Famicom game called Jesus for obvious reasons. Here are two versions of Devil World for the Famicom and basically they were less than $3 a piece. This is a blue version of the PSP 3000 that I hadn't seen before, and I was able to pick it up for about $63 US. And like I mentioned previously, Japan got a bunch of color variants for the PlayStation Vita, and the metallic red one was one I was looking for, so it was cool to find that. And here's the other red one I was really looking for for, frankly, many years. And so this is the other PSP Vita that I was dying to get, and I was very happy to finally find it as well as a grip for it for less than $5. But overall, I just had an absolute blast in Japan. I mean, it was overwhelming. I couldn't understand the language, but I didn't really care because everyone was so friendly and helpful. Plus having Kinsey there was a huge help. But really the video game culture, the amazing food, the great atmosphere, it was a very memorable experience. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Love to know if you have plans to go to Japan. If you have specific questions you would like to ask me, please post them down in the comments below. In the previous video, I was actually surprised how many people have either been to Japan or planning on going. And so there's a lot of things that you need to know before you go, especially if you're a Westerner like us, um, especially if you wanna do it cheaply and smartly. So maybe we can all help each other. So, all right guys, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for subscribing and take care. Hey guys, Metal Jesus here. Now in the past you know I've thrown parties at my house and invited all my friends over, drink beer, play games, hang out, have fun, but this year I'm going big. I've actually rented a beach house in Oregon, invited a bunch of my friends over for five nights. Let's take a look. Why am I up so early on a Thursday? Well, you and I know there can only be one reason, and that would be the Metal Jesus. Yep, all his fault. I blame him, and he's buying me coffee. But the really good reason I'm up so damn early is because he and I are gonna meet up. We're going on an epic road trip down to a beach house in Oregon where we're gonna meet the entire Metal Jesus crew and hang out for about five days or six months, depending on if the eclipse turns everyone into zombies. Hey guys, Radical hey. Reggie here, and I am here with Miss Metal Jesus. Hello. And we are on our way to go to a beach house and party. Uh, yeah, we're doing a Metal Jesus crew weekend. It's gonna yeah. be cool. Something we, we kind of been wanting to do for a couple years now, uh, yeah. since uh, we haven't done a party in a while, so this is a way for us all to get out and just have a good time. Trunk and Master Paul's gonna be there. Kenzie. Kelsey's gonna be there. Anna. Anna, Anna's gonna be there as well, so I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, it's um, be fun. So we're heading down to Oregon. I don't have anything interesting to show you, so I'm about to eat a burrito. Hey guys, Kinsey here, and I'm on my way down to the Metal Jesus Rocks party weekend in Oregon. I can't wait! So we are now about 15 minutes away from the Metal Jesus House of Mayhem or Doom or whatever, <laughs> whatever we're going to be calling it. Drive went really well. Woke up, as you saw, very sleepy this morning at like 5 in the morning because the eclipse is happening this weekend and traffic is great. Burrito time! Paul and I finally got down to Manzanita, Oregon. That's a really small town on the Oregon coast. And we pull up to our beach house and oh my, this place is amazing. Look at this thing. It is so nice. Look at that view right out to the beach. Such a beautiful day. When we walk in here, I just couldn't be happier. I didn't know what I was getting into when I first rented this place. I was hoping it was gonna be cool, but I had no idea. This is the top floor here. 
As you can see, it's a kitchen. There's a, some drunk dude there. I don't know, I guess he comes to the place. Three bedrooms on this floor, plus a bathroom. Huge living room, a bunch of really cool little touches here and there. Of course, we started unpacking some of the things we brought, some food. Of course, you need the booze. We also brought a bunch of snacks as well. And then we're gonna go check out the downstairs. And again, I had no idea what I was getting into when I rented this place. And down here, it's a whole other suite. Whole kitchen, whole living room. There's two bedrooms down here. There's a huge backyard. I was so happy because again, I invited most of the Metal Jesus crew down here. So I knew we would all fit. Speaking of, people are starting to arrive. Hey, what's going on? We have Reggie in the house! I'm in the house. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, and, and what'd you bring? I brought my trusty 3DS. Uh, okay. PS4 controller, just in case. Yeah. Uh, what else did I bring? A bunch of games. And, uh, and? Oh, the grand finale. The snow cone machine that you guys have seen in our pickups video, we're gonna put it to work. So, yeah. I know you guys got to see it, but now it's gonna be operational. So, I'm pretty pumped for that. Mrs. Metal Jesus. Mrs. Metal Jesus in the house. With her own shot glass. Yes, yeah. we, we're ready for you. Here, here you go, Don. Here, here you go. Yeah. Oh, nice. There you go. We're ready to start. <laughs> Boom, there it is, gone. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah? See? Yeah. <laughs> you know, let me get a shot of that, man. Whoa. Yeah, here we go. Well, yeah. okay, I think you better set uh, radical old Reggie. Oh, right here. I cup ready. Let's do this. Oh yeah, got that set. Set up a DMP to, one there as well. Even take the glasses off. <laughs> for it. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll do one with a uh, here here with a regenerator. Here is to us. We are the best. There were a few, but now they're dead. To those who've gone before us. Where are the wives? And they've left already. Damn. <laughs> You're just right there. I remember. Yeah. That band. Huh? Ooh. How much hair do you have on your chest? I know. Yeah. Because you might have more now. I know, right? Oh, it's yeah. like a little nativity scene in there. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Hello. Hi. Welcome. Hi. You made it. Finally. <laughs> This would be embarrassing if this wasn't the place. Hey, Anna. Hey. Yay, Anna and Caitlin are here, but we're still waiting for Kelsey and Cody. I guess they got stuck in a bit of traffic. Now you'll notice that sadly, the immortal John Hancock and also John Riggs, they couldn't make it. It's such a bummer because I would love to hang out with those dudes, but they had prior commitments to their family, so they will be missed. So it's 9 p.m. We've been on the road to Oregon since like 3.30 or 4 or something like that. There was a lot of traffic. Everyone wants to see the sun this weekend. Or but, not see or the not sun. Or not, not see the sun. <laughs> uh, we've got a dog in the back you cannot see because it's nighttime. But there's a dog. But we're going to a house in Oregon to hang out with some Metal Jesus people and have a good time and drink and play some video games. I'm excited for the vacation, mini vacation. So, yeah. The next morning we woke up and it was glorious outside. But what do gamers do? Well, we have games to play. That's right. So right off the bat, you will see us playing a ton of games. And this was my entire plan. Basically, I brought, let's see here, a PlayStation 4 down, a Switch, I also brought an N64, my GameCube, and basically had these set up in both living rooms so that anybody could walk down there at any moment and just fire up and play a bunch of games. I wanted to create an atmosphere where it was just fun to hang out and, I don't know, just nerd out for a while. It was really cool. Oh, no, the, 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 no, the meat! Someone cooked this meat. It was ready. Yeah. It was I touched the bone instead of the meat. Here, here. Here's the burger. Somebody. Oh, somebody get that burger. Help wheels. Help wheels. Ah, <laughs> uh, look behind you. Oh, yeah. I'm out of ammo. No, don't look. No, 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 no. But we are at the beach, and the weather was absolutely glorious. So. As the day went on, I was like, you know what, guys? We need to go down to the beach. And everybody put on their sandals, grabbed a football, 
And we all went down to the beach and just hung out for probably a good hour or hour and a half, basically till the sun went down. This was really cool. It was nice to see everyone hanging out, talking, goofing off, just having a great time. This was so killer. <laughs> I have sand in places, in places I don't want to talk about. Uh huh. Sand in places I didn't know I had places. I'm gonna saw myself in half walking home. How's a nature, Reg? How's hmm? a oh. nature? Oh yeah, Twitter. Uh. <laughs> Be thorough. I have sand in places that only. Uh, only Liz really knows about and doesn't really want to know about. Yeah, so so, so pay extra attention right. down there. There we go. Mm. Uh, turn around, turn around, turn around, you. soldier. All right, drop trout. <sighs> <laughs> All right, I gotta have my... Uh... We woke up the next morning, grabbed our switches, and played a bunch of Splatoon 2. So much fun. But as it got closer to noon, we got hungry, so we hopped in the car and caravaned up to a little town called Cannon Beach. It's just north of Manzanita. It's a cute little town that has a brewery that Kinsey wanted to check out. We also grabbed some lunch, headed down to the public beach, and checked out some rocks and you know, nature stuff. That's a big rock. That's a big rock. Damn big rock. Damn big rock. No playing around. <laughs> ah, the ultimate distraction. He took my beer. <laughs> ah, Anthony! Ah, that's there. Damn it. All right, rub my head for luck. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hey guys, Metal Jesus here, and I am back again with Drunken Mr. Paul. And I'm super excited to be here because we're going to do another Gamer Eats. Not only another Gamer Eats, but we got the Metal Jesus crew together at a beach house in Oregon. I get to make eats for the best gamers on the planet! Woo! All right, dude, that was epic. That was yes. a fantastic yes. idea to bring the entire crew down here to the beach in Oregon. Yes. I just really wish that John Riggs and John Hancock could have been here, man. Miss you, buddy. Oh, I know, I know. And you know what? We're gonna have to do this again because it was so much fun. And oh, absolutely. I might be a little bit hungover, you know. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> a lot yeah. a lot of fun was had, maybe yeah. too much fun, but uh, we will definitely be doing it again. And if you guys want to see the videos of the I Hate You, the Gamer Eats, and who knows what else, yeah. uh, they're coming soon. <laughs> And well, I'll link to them up in the uh, the right hand corner. Yeah, so. the bathroom vids, the uh, conventional, the the time when Kelsey is the face plant. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. The, yeah. The, the the dick punch heard around the world. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one's actually true. The other ones were a lie, total lie. Awesome. But it was a great time. Thank you so much oh, for doing this. Thank you for coming down and helping me. You were my right hand man. He did a lot of it, so that was very cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and my wife as well, who is shooting the video. Thanks, was, Becky. Was behind yeah. the scenes the whole time. Yes. So. 
All right, guys. Thanks very much for watching. Thank you for subscribing and take care. Cheers. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this. I am so lucky and blessed to know so many cool people within the Seattle retro gaming community. I love having these guys on my channel and it was a great opportunity to say thank you by renting this beach house and inviting them down. You guys are gonna to wanna to be subscribed to my channel because I have a Gamer Eats as well as an I Hate You episode, plus other videos coming soon to my channel. All right guys, thanks for watching. Metal Jesus here and I am back again with these goobers. The Goober Patrol is here. That's right. And we we are going to go down to Portland for the Portland Retro Gaming Expo 2014. Heck oh, yes. Thank goodness yeah. you of the year. I so what we're going to do is we're going to do a couple things. We are going to look for like our holy grail item. This is the item that you would love to own in your game room, your man cave, your nerd cave, whatever. And you have to kind of guess what you think of pay for it. I'm going to start it off here. So I am the Metal Jesus and I want to find a C CDX, a Sega CDX. I want to pay about 150 bucks for it. Okay, what I want to find is a, there's a couple things. One, I want to find a copy of Blur, a game that Metal Jesus turned me on to for less than 20 bucks. I want 10 bucks for that. But the the Uber one is I am dying to find a copy of Gato, either for Mac oh, or yeah. um, PC from Spectrum Holobyte. And the Oh my God, Grail would be if I can find a Macintosh to run it on. So the games I want to pay Ooh, about 15 bucks each for, if I can find an actual old Macintosh, I'm willing to pay up to, and I'm a cheap bastard, so I'm going to say 50 bucks for that. 50 bucks, wow. all Ooh, right. Man. Well, well, I'm Barnacles from Barnacles Nerdgasm, and I've got a big one that's going to blow all these guys out of the water. I'm saying that to all the boys. Hold on, <laughs> you guys, prepare to have your minds blown. It took a lot of thought for this. You ready? I am looking for a Super Mario Brothers Duck Hunt combo cartridge. Hmm. And I am expecting Ooh. to spend $5. <laughs> and as Man. my bonus, I want to find a broken light zapper. I want one that doesn't work. I want a confirmed broken light zapper and I'm going to also pay $5 for that. I might have one here and I'll sell it to you for 10. <laughs> you know Shouldn't we can always just find him a, a working one and break it. Yeah, that's true. So my budget's $10 just to be clear. All right. All right. I am the big JB and I'm looking for three things. First thing, I'm looking for Faxanadu for the NES in the box, in the little case. I hmm. want it in its condition. It doesn't have to be mint, doesn't have to be in the shrink yeah. wrap or anything, but I want that. Second thing, Metroid, classic. I gotta have that. And the third thing, I wanna see if I can find a copy of Ready Player One by Ernest Cline, hardback, first printing, autographed by the author. So, in order of the things that I said, I pay, uh, let's see, I guess 20 bucks for Faxanadu, 30 for Metroid, and uh, probably 50 for the book. Ooh, Ooh big expander. So, whew, what's the challenge here, you ask? I heard that. So here's the deal. There are some rules, and their usual Drunken Master Paul slash dick move rules. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> so the deal is, if you hit your target spot on, no points. For every dollar, what? for every dollar, <laughs> I love hitting this guy. What? For every dollar you spend less, you get a point. For every dollar you have to spend more, you lose a point. And at the end, we'll come up with some horribly embarrassing, disastrous thing for the loser, uh, possibly a trophy of shame. Can I change my answer yeah, based on these my... rules? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I got two $5, I can't win! <laughs> well, now, you can, if I can only find a Macintosh for 75, I lose Wait, 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 can I, can I, can I, uh, I'm gonna ask for an amendment to the rule. I think you should get an instant 100 points if you can convince them to give it to you for free. Ooh. Ooh. Now that I like. Why I like that. These rules are subject to change depending on how much beer we <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Oh, no. All right. Woo! Let's rock. Where's Rebecca? <laughs> That's immediately the sound I heard in my head when you're doing that. I was like, rave! <laughs> All 
right, guys. Well, you know, we got the contest going with Metal Jesus to try to beat him on the scavenger hunt. Well, I happened to come across Zach right here, and he happened to have not just one item right here, which is one of my items. Notice it says $5 right there. And then he has a broken, that's really broken, look at that, broken light zapper. So I could pay $10 for these items, but I told Zach I got a pretty big YouTube channel. And I'm going to advertise the channel if he gives me these items. So, sir, may I take those items free of charge? Absolutely. Suck it. Suck it, Metal Jesus. That's 200 points, buddy. Yeah, let's see you beat that. <laughs> yeah, got, him, got him bloating. Tired. 30, 30 minutes into it. No, see, the thing is, I pointed this out to him. We said you have to get out the convention. I think that's bullshit because this is the convention. He's it's saying not it's not open. open. Nah. But we never said anything about being open. Here's not technically the convention. Technically, it's the load in. So, I'm. So, let's see your badge. Wait, let's wait. see your badge. What badge? Your badge. What to get in. Yeah, I guess that would be that would be the proof, wouldn't it? Is you're not at the convention if you don't have a badge. Hold on, wait a second, guys. Guys, not I, bad, I'll bad. show you, you my stuff all tomorrow. Your cards. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh no, it's okay. It's all right. Hey, I don't have anything yet. I'll show you tomorrow what I found. <laughs> Ooh, that's in my butt crack right now. Oh, yeah. oh now we know it doesn't work. Phew. You smelled it. Did you have to smell it? Was that necessary? Well, that's yeah, not that bad, actually. Yeah, here. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Oh my God, everybody is so butt hurt right now that I already won the contest in like 15 minutes. Oh, no, 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 no. You didn't no, win no, the no. contest. Butt hurt. No, just because no, no, it's your channel, you don't get to see everything you want. No, take the camera. Pew, pew, pew. <laughs> so technically, you got your stuff, but your know, game ain't over yet, Sparky. It's not over yet because if one of you manages to get a $200 discount, yeah, yeah, like that's gonna happen. Ease back, ease off, ease off. We got gotcha. you. I got that. <laughs> hey, do you know I got that for free? Free? I threw it around. You my got YouTube. Mario Duck Hunt for free? That's so unheard of. I was really? like, this that went down. I was like, I was like, yo, play ya. I need a Mario Duck Hunt purchase for free, you know? And he was like, you have a YouTube channel? And I was like, I do. You know when I got a Mario Duck Hunt card for free? What'd you get? 1985. Oh, burn. <laughs> yeah, burn. Yeah. Hey, hey, Jerry, let me see that. So this guy here has a Sega CDX. Can we take a look at it? Yeah. Awesome. Oh, all right. Ooh, with Echo the Dolphin. There we go. Tested and it works. Hey, buddy. Would you take 125? Oh! Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Quick sit rep. I have found a copy of Gato and I did find a Mac Classic for 60 bucks. So that's only 10 over my target. However, I've got to find Gato on the Mac before I can buy the Macintosh. So that's kind of in reserve. Um, in other news, I just got a text from uh, Barnic Bar uh, Barnacles. Um, he'll be here. He'll be here about now. Um, and his shoe is for sale. All right, so last night we're at this bar, right? And I start drinking some pretty hefty beer, and I'm not gonna lie, I got a little drunk. Well, next thing you know, they steal my Nintendo cartridge because they're all butthurt that I already won the competition by finding that cartridge. And so anyways, they take the cartridge. Long story short, the cartridge ends up in a lot of random drunk people's pants, and I want my cartridge back. So I kind of assault Paul a little bit with my foot, but he grabs it and he steals my shoe and my sock. So now I don't have my cartridge, I don't have my shoe and my sock. And then my wife shows up to pick me up at the bar, so I just left. Well, I want my shoe back. But the problem is, Paul said it's for sale somewhere out here on the floor at Retro Gaming Expo. And for every minute I spend not getting it, I'm basically losing a point out of the contest. So I gotta go find my shoe right now before somebody else does. bit more than I wanted, but I haven't pot it yet. So I'm gonna see if I can get him down. I'm gonna see if I can negotiate what it. What did down. you find it for? Fifteen dollars. And you said ten. Ten. That's what I said. So we'll see. We'll see what I can do. I'll follow up later. <laughs> Yeah. 
What's up? Yeah. Hey, you haven't happened to see a black shoe for sale uh, here I anywhere? Think, I think it was over that way. Over that way? Yeah, they're auctioning it off. All right, thank you so much. Metal Jesus stole my damn shoe when I was drunk, and now I gotta go find it. Excuse me, sir, have you seen a shoe for sale? No, I have not. Darn it! Oh, they're probably totally yanking my chain. I don't see a shoe anywhere. Excuse me, gun ninjas, have you seen a shoe for sale anywhere around here? No. All right, so far I have not found my shoe. Haven't found the shoe. You want the pose? Oh, oh, pose yeah. That's, like, that's the look. Right, Thor and on. Iron Man. Are we good? Yep, keep going. Alright. Guess who got a shoe? You're on site today. Aha! I found it! I found the shoe! Hey, I'm a little insulted nobody bought it for five bucks. That's people were asking, they're like, what's the shoe? I'm like, it's because you didn't you didn't put it's from but you didn't say it's Barnacles' shoe. That was the problem. All right, I'm doing pretty good. I found one booth that's selling what I'm looking for, but it's a little bit more than I want to pay. So you wouldn't haggle at first, so I might give it some time and go back. I found a couple other booths that have the cartridge, but it's not in the box. So I gotta find out what my penalty is if I don't have it in the box. So I'm gonna do that. Found a couple other places that had Metroid, not in the box yet, and I haven't found my book, but that's my stretch goal. So we'll check it out, see if I can figure out what my penalty is. All right, so I must be pretty good at this whole acting thing because I just convinced a guy playing the Iron Man pinball machine that Josh was basically Robert Downey Jr.'s body double and we're shooting a documentary today. And he literally like, stopped playing his game and walked away to let him play. You know, you have really hairy knuckles. I've seen this for the first time. <laughs> Seriously, dude. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It was like distracting. Yeah. I really apologize. I'm like, damn, dude. I think that's a problem. I really want to shave those. They're nice. <laughs> They're nice. <laughs> Sorry. Please continue. This is really hard. Yeah. 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 Wow. That's nice. Oh. Reminds me of my wedding night, really. I think I'm just wasting all your alcohol at this point. Uh, that's that's nice. Yeah. You know, has a drinking problem. This that's is that's really, a good look. This is really hard to drink out of. So now it's time to look at what we got and what the score is. So I'm gonna go first, okay? Okay, you go first now. Did you find your Holy Grail item? I did, actually fairly quickly. I got a Sega CDX. It's one of the last consoles that I wanted for my collection and it's awesome. I mean, I expected to pay 150 bucks. I got it for 125, so Ooh. I think that means I- 25 points. I'm 25, 25 points. points. Yeah. I'm feeling pretty good about that. Yeah. All right, sure. well I awesome. found mine. Um, it was actually a surprise. I think I get a bonus for this. Uh, I was looking for Gato on the PC or the Mac, but I found it on Atari XE. The fact you found this at all blows me away. Oh, it's incredible. <laughs> I, mean, I think so. Yeah. I, I feel like I need to step in here and say that that is a gross violation of the rules of the contest because he specifically <laughs> did say which platform he was looking for. The beauty ah. of it is that Drunken Master Paul makes the rules, so. <laughs> So, Can't but the argue with is, that. The thing is, it was 20 bucks. I got it for 15, but as I recall, Ooh. I said I want to get it for 10. Mm -hmm. oh. What? So, You're over. I'm over, but I'm going to call this and say I got some a really cool version. Only five points over, so I'm going to call it neutral. I get no points. 
Uh, I will accept neutral. Okay. Neutral. Right, no we'll points neutral. for me, but I didn't lose any points. All right. Okay, so. Okay. So, I did get mine. I got Fax Xanadu in the box with all the stuff for 10 bucks, which is what I thought I'd get to pay for it. So, really? there it is, yes. So the other two were stretch goals. I didn't get to the other two, but you know, I'm not gonna pay $89 for Metroid. You know, yeah. uh, I, and that's way, way over my goal. So yeah, but I'm very pleased to find this. And Ooh. I also got a little something for uh, Mr. Paul. We all know that Paul's a ninja. So this isn't quite ninja category, but I did get you episode or issue number one of Paul the Samurai. Ooh. Ooh. That's what he would look like if he ate his Wheaties. <laughs> right. <laughs> Ooh. 3D. Ooh. So that puts you at zero points. Zero correct? points. I'm That's technically right. winning at this You're point. In the you, are. you are. You are winning. I, I, honestly, hey, <laughs> this is rigged. I think, I think I'm going to have to step in here and ruin it. I found I, both of my Holy Grail items. And I found, boom, broken Nintendo light zapper. I said I'd pay five bucks for it. You know how much I paid for this? Zero, which Ooh. means... 100 points. points. There you go. Boom. Now, hold on. Just wait for it. Yeah, where's the second item, man? Yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. Where, where's the second? Oh, no. Well, well, I did. These guys can attest to it. They've seen it. I, I did get a Nintendo Mario Duck Hunt cartridge, but I don't know where it is right now. Hmm. Hmm, funny hmm. you should say that because you guys saw it. We oh, have there this it is. Right here. <laughs> Okay. There you go. You can have that back now. All right. So, um, little, little this, uh, worse this, wear there. I, I remember being in slightly better condition. And where has this thing been? <laughs> right there. You ready? All right. Five, four, three, two, one. Oh, you can Ladies, it can it. be broken, sure, sure, but it can go anywhere sure, sure, that you want it to go. Because we're gonna do a video tomorrow. That's it? That's it? That was awesome, guys. I think uh, your cartridge spent a typical night in Portland. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, so I hear. No big deal. Yeah. If you haven't spent the kind of night in Portland, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. yeah we had a great time coming down here, um, as we do every year. Um, yes. Yes. It's a great event, and there's a lot of weird going on, and you really got to rinse that thing in Purell. Trust me. Yes. <laughs> I brought some with me. And the cartridge, too. <laughs> and, <laughs> and boil it. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, thank you very much to Portland Retro Gaming Expo for getting us in. Yeah. 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 Thanks, guys. We love, we love this this expo. It's one of the best in the world. So thank you guys for, for coming down with me. Absolutely. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. And next year, Greece. I'll be back. In one piece. Yeah. The, the weird awesome. Uh, Are you still so recording? Why would you do this? Okay. Why? Why would you do this? <laughs> Okay, yes, yeah, so I think I that said it, I would do this for Ultimate Collector. I got this at your booth. He was awesome and hooked me up. So I said I would do it. I'm following through. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> Come just do this. There you go. I'll just... <laughs> Thanks, dude. I've only seen like one or two of those. Yeah. You gotta so fall was, down, James. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Like, is that acid? Is no. It, it's smoking. Hand, hand sanitizer. This place has been, <laughs> ooh, man. Yeah, it's I gotta get smart. that, dude, I don't wanna carry this around smelling like butthole all day. <laughs> <laughs> if it was only just butthole. <laughs> oh, that's better. Yeah. yeah. Group hug, group <laughs> hug. Get in here, get in here. <laughs> oh, we almost Aww. left Tony Stark. Oh, mm -hmm. Josh is a lover too. Hey everybody, Metal Jesus here, and today I am taking you on a retro road trip. Yes, I am going game hunting, but the difference is, is that I'm going to visit towns and retro gaming stores that I have not highlighted yet on my YouTube channel. Now, as you guys know, I live in the Seattle area, and I'll be honest, I don't get out of the city as much as I should, but that's all changing today. We're gonna visit four of these retro gaming stores, plus some pawn shops, all the way up to pretty much the Canadian border. 
And at the end of this video, I'm gonna show you everything that I picked up and I got some good stuff. All right, I loaded up the GTI and now it's time to give her a bath and uh, she's looking all pretty and ready to go. All right, so the first place we're gonna head to is Everett, Washington. Now Everett is about 30 to 40 minutes from downtown Seattle and it may sound familiar to some of you if you collect Funko Pops. That is because the HQ of Funko is in downtown Everett. And as you can see here, it is very popular. There was a line of people waiting outside just to get in and feed their Funko Pop addiction. But that's not where I'm gonna go. I'm actually gonna go about a block from there to a retro gaming store called Next Level Games. I love how you're greeted at the store with a throne made of non-working consoles on one side. I thought that was so hilarious. And then on the other side, there is a tribute to vintage gaming. That's a good sign. I'm getting a good vibe here. Now, unfortunately, this little store has been hit pretty hard by the pandemic. They used to be known for hosting a lot of competitions here, but in the last year, they've kind of had to pivot a little bit and change the layout of the store. Hopefully they're gonna get back to full power soon. But right off the bat, I noticed that they had an unusual amount of NES games. And it turns out that actually a local collector in the Everett area traded in their entire NES collection. And that included a bunch of rare and uncommon games as well as some unlicensed NES games. I was pretty impressed. Also, these guys know that I'm into collecting big box PC games. And so from out of the back, they brought this box of PC games for me to take a look at. Uh, everything from the late 80s to the 90s, and they sold me the entire box for $50. And it, they did that because they normally don't sell these here. They don't stock PC games, but they like them to go to collectors like me. I thought that was pretty sweet. That's a good start to my retro road trip. And by the way, this box has so many games in it that I'm actually gonna share it with some of the other PC collectors that I know. So at the end of this video, I'll show you which ones I decided to keep. But overall, I'm very happy to see that the store is still in business. While I was there, it had a bunch of people coming in and out. It's basically the only retro gaming store in the Everett area. So if you happen to be traveling north of Seattle, you go through Everett, you might wanna stop and give it a look because you never know what you're gonna find. Moving on from Next Level Games, we're gonna go north about 10 to 15 minutes to Marysville and visit Another Castle. Now I've talked about Another Castle, some of their other stores in other videos, but I don't think I've shown their Marysville location. And that's a real shame because this store is just as good as all the other ones. Immediately you walk in here and you see what makes these stores so special. Like the other locations, it's basically a mix of games, physical games, as well as their arcade and pinball machines. It's hard to say if this location has more games than their flagship Edmonds location, but I would say it's pretty close and they're different too. That's the cool thing about another castle is that they actually share the, the machines. They actually move them around so you don't get the same machines at every location. I think that's pretty cool. It's a reason to visit all of them. One thing that stuck out immediately though, is that they had this collection of light gun games. And I don't really see that very often. It turns out that a local collector brought in their entire gun con collection and they had them all here. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. That's something you typically would only see like a, at a retro gaming expo. Now I did pick up one of these, but you'll have to wait till the end to see which one it was. The other thing I wanna mention, and maybe you've picked up on it, is that a lot of these quote unquote, you know, retro gaming stores have newer titles as well. Yes, they have all the previous older generation of games, but they also have a really good selection of current gen stuff, you know, Switch, PS5, Xbox series stuff. And often, I mean, it's true, but often they are better than GameStop. They're less picked over, especially when it comes to Switch, man. You know, you'll see stuff in here that I had no idea there was even a physical release for it. All right, moving on from Marysville and another castle, we're gonna head north to Mount Vernon. So Mount Vernon is a small town, has about 30,000 people or so, and it doesn't have any dedicated retro gaming stores, but what it does have is a bunch of thrift stores and pawn shops. And so this is definitely one of the places I stop when I'm heading north because 
again, it's not picked over like some of the other big cities, and you never quite know what you're going to find here. For instance, you see here that they have a box NES Classic Edition, and yeah, that's about what they go for, so you're not going to get a, you know, really good deal here, but again, it does look like it's in good condition. They also have some loose gaming consoles as well as handhelds, handful of Switch and DS games there, but overall not a ton of stuff. But again, it's worth stopping in if you happen to be in the area. All right, it's the next morning and we're gonna continue on the retro road trip up to Bellingham, Washington. Now, normally I would take the freeway, but this time I'm gonna take a little bit of a detour. I'm gonna take the scenic route. We're gonna go on Chuckanut Drive. Now, Chuckanut Drive is considered one of the most scenic and beautiful drives you can take in all of Washington State, and I highly recommend it because it's this really cool, twisty and turny road that follows the waterfront. It's absolutely beautiful. It's also a little dangerous. You have to be careful. You can't drive this very fast. Sometimes there are bicycles on there, uh, but it is so worth it. And so I'm taking Chuckanut Drive up to Bellingham, Washington. Bellingham, Washington is the last big city before the Canadian border. It has about 90,000 people. And as you can see from this footage, it's absolutely beautiful. It's, it, it's got so much here to take in and just marvel at. It's got the waterfront. It's got a small town vibe, but again, it's got 90,000 people. So it's got everything you would want. It's got a really cool downtown area. Plus, and the reason why I'm here is because it has two really kick-ass retro gaming stores. The first store we're going to visit is called Cosmic Games. Now, I have not visited this before, but I've heard a lot about it. And that is because it is a really cool mix of tabletop pen and paper games and video games. And as I walk in the door here, I'm blown away by just how big this is. So, you know, half of it is dedicated to tabletop pen and paper games. Uh, they also have rows and rows of card games, Pokemon, as well as uh, Magic the Gathering. They have tables over here where people can play. You can just basically reserve a table, do a tournament, play with your friends. And then over in this corner, they have a bunch of games, both old and new. Now, I'll be honest, I don't know that much about Magic the Gathering and even less about collecting Pokemon cards. And so I asked them, I was like, you know, what would people be really interested in? What would be really exciting for people to see? And they brought out these two brand new unopened Pokemon card boxes that I guess were printed by Wizards of the Coast. So these are incredibly old and incredibly valuable. And so I asked him, I'm like, how much would these go for? And he was like, thousands, maybe tens of thousands. I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I had no idea. Again, you hear the Pokemon's, you know, valuable and collectible, but I guess these are incredibly hard to find, especially unopened. And so they just had rows and rows of single cards, pretty much anything that most people would want. I guess a lot of people from the Seattle area will drive up here just to help fill out their decks. So yeah, that was pretty interesting to see. Again, it's a whole world I just know very little about. And as you can see, the video game side of it is no slouch either. They've got a bunch of stuff, again, all generations worth. They have a bunch of complete in box systems as well as a bunch of accessories. You see some Japanese imports there. And then in the glass case, they had a bunch of loose systems there. You see a bunch of handhelds. And then check this out, there is a Sega CDX. That is something that you don't see every day. And then they offered to show me what they call the dungeon, which is basically the back area where they keep all the extra stock in, as well as where they uh, process their eBay listings and just some kind of random stuff that they sell. But you guys know me, I was really interested in seeing what they had as far as big box PC games. Now, all of this stuff is listed currently on eBay. That's what he said. Um, so if you see something here that you want, that is a way to get access to it. It's cool when some of these gaming stores do a lot of eBay because I know a lot of you who watch this video, you know, may not have the ability to come all the way to Bellingham, Washington, but you can jump on this if you wish. And I did pick up two of these as well as some other stuff out on the main floor. And I'm gonna show you at the end of this video.
I had a good time at Cosmic Games, and now it's time to head over to Reset Games, which is just a couple miles away. Reset Games used to be an independent store, but it was bought by the owner of another castle almost about, I say, 10 years ago. But they decided to keep the name because so many people were familiar with it here in Bellingham. But it's definitely part of the Another Castle family and has a very similar vibe to that. And they also share much of the same inventory. As a matter of fact, when you go into Reset Games here and you're looking for a game, they can tell you if the other locations have it and vice versa. And sometimes also deliver it to those other locations. And as you can see here, the store is definitely on the smaller side, but they told me that they actually have plans to expand it. So like the other locations, they're actually gonna double the size here and start putting in some arcade machines and some pinball games. But there was a lot here that caught my eye, including this N64 DD. This is the floppy disk expansion for the N64 that only came out in Japan. For some reason, they have one here up in Bellingham, who knew? as well as this custom Game Gear here that has the McWill LCD mod. That's a very sweet mod. So if you are into the Game Gear, but you hate the original screen, this is the solution for you. I also love seeing all this retro themed vinyl records that's becoming super popular in the last probably like five years or so. All right, well, I did my shopping, I did my road trip, I visited some awesome retro gaming stores, but it's time to head back home and take a look at the pickups. All right, the first thing I wanna show you is a present I bought my wife. I saw this and I immediately knew that she would love it. She's a huge Witcher fan, she loves Geralt. And I was surprised to see this. This is Geralt sitting in the bathtub with a rubber ducky. I can't believe they made this. This is so funny. So yeah, I bought this for my wife, Rebecca. She loved it. This is great. I have a list of 3DS games I'm looking for, and this Fire Emblem game is on that list. I was surprised to see it at Cosmic Games, brand new, unopened, and uh, the collector's edition or limited edition here. I had to pick it up. It's got the pins. It's got the soundtrack. Uh, it's got this really cool full-size art book. Yeah, happy to get that. I mentioned in another castle that they had all those light gun games and I had to pick this one up, Ninja Assault with a Gun Con 2 for the PlayStation 2. Ah, uh, yes, so cool. This looks honestly brand new. I mean, that gun may be brand new. At Reset Games, I picked up a couple DS games, including Mega Man ZX. This is a game I did not have in the collection, as well as Yoshi's Island DS. Again, I've been on a huge DS and 3DS kick over the last year or so, just because they're, they're just getting so hard to find. And so every time I see them, some of them that I don't have that I want, I have to pick them up. Out of that box of PC games, these are the ones I'm gonna keep from my collection, including Lighthouse the Dark Bean. So this is a game published by Sierra back when I was working there. And it's a very interesting game because it's an adventure game similar to Myst where it has those pre-rendered graphics, has that sort of puzzle-based gameplay, uh, and it didn't sell very well. It's, It's got its fans, it actually reviewed fairly well, but it's just kind of a bit of a hidden gem, and surprisingly, I did not have a copy in my collection, uh, so now I do, that's very cool. Some of the games I pulled out of the box I didn't have in the collection so far, including a couple Microprose games. And I'm reminded at just how varied Microprose was as a publisher and developer. They put out all sorts of games. Also have an SSI game there and also Spring Break. Ah, Spring Break. Those were hilarious games too. But this was a game I was very excited to see in the box, Darklands by Microprose. So this is an RPG that's very different than many of them at the time. You know, at the time you had a lot of RPGs that were based on Dungeons and Dragons. They'd have magic, they'd have orcs and elves and all these magical creatures. Darklands has none of that. It is a historical RPG. It's meant to be very realistic. And, and so in that way, it stands out. It stands out as something very special. So I'm really excited to give it a try. Another game I was very excited to find and add to the collection is Heroes of Might and Magic 2 and its expansion pack. I played this originally when it came out for months on end. It's such a great game. And uh, for whatever reason, I lost the physical copy years ago. It's great to have it back. 
And then a couple handhelds I picked up, including this PlayStation Vita Slim. This is the light blue edition that only came out in Japan. I just thought this looks really cool. I like the white on the top and then the light blue on the back. And uh, again, only being released in Japan, I was really surprised to see this. Uh, you know, finding these special edition Vitas is becoming very hard, uh, very uncommon. So that was a great pickup. And then I recently did a video on all my Nintendo handhelds and many of you pointed out that I did not have an original DS Lite. Well, now I do. And I got it at a really great price. It's a little used. You know, it's a little grimy, but that's okay. I'll clean it up. It works fine. All right, well, that is my two-day retro road trip north of Seattle, pretty much all the way up to the Canadian border. I had a ton of fun doing this. I met some great people, and I can't wait to go back. Uh, you guys got some great retro gaming stores up there. And honestly, I just love doing these kind of videos, highlighting some of the smaller mom-and-pop stores up there, hopefully maybe get you guys some more business, you know, people traveling through the area, That's that would just be awesome. And if you guys like these videos and would like to see me do more of them, please give this video a thumbs up. Please share it on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that sort of stuff. I would greatly appreciate it. And as always, I wanna thank you for watching my channel. Thank you for subscribing and take care. Hey guys, Middle Jesus here, and today I am very excited to be traveling again. I'm gonna be going to Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm so excited for this. I've been traveling a lot lately. This is like my third trip in probably three months or something like that. But this time I'm primarily going down to visit family, but you guys know me. While I'm down there, I'm gonna have to visit some retro gaming stores. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna visit three of them that I've heard some good things about. Plus, I'm also gonna check out the Pinball Hall of Fame Museum. And at the end of this video, I'm gonna show you everything that I picked up as well as doing some sightseeing. It's been several years since I have traveled down to Las Vegas, and I didn't exactly know what to expect. Like I said, I have family there, and so I get reports every now and then, and I've heard that Vegas is starting to come back after all the shutdowns. Uh, so I'm actually pretty excited to land there and kind of see what it's all about. Now, one of the interesting things about this trip is that we booked it probably six or eight months ago when Vegas was shut down and they were basically just begging for people to book trips there. So we actually got this trip extremely cheap, but more importantly than that, this hotel that we're staying in, the Palazzo, they were they were giving these, these rooms away. And check out this room. I mean, it's massive, yet it was the price of like staying at the Best Western. So of course we were very excited to go down there and check it out, but also just be able to stay in this amazing room. And I have to say, Vegas was busier than I expected it to be. Like I said, I didn't know exactly what to expect, but I had heard that Vegas was back, and absolutely, as you can see here, yeah, Vegas is definitely back. It was packed here. Now, I'll be honest with you guys, I didn't know exactly what to expect when it comes to the retro gaming scene down in Vegas. None of my family's really into it, quite like I am, but I did reach out to Reggie a little bit, who had been down here earlier this year, and. His experience was a little bit hit and miss depending on the stores. He told me the ones that I should probably check out and I'm glad I did because first on that list was a store, actually there's two of them, we're gonna hit both of them, but is Retro City Games. And I gotta be honest, as soon as I pulled up, I was not disappointed because they were running a sidewalk sale. You see it right here, out in the front. Every single game here was a dollar every single game here. Now, it was full of a bunch of common, you know, titles, nothing really super rare, obviously. But as you can see, there was a lot of stuff here, especially if you are going for like a complete collection or maybe you're looking for something new and cheap to play. Wow, I thought this was a great first impression. But then you go inside and you get a sense of why this place is so highly regarded in the Vegas area. Uh, they have a little of everything. As you see here, they have obviously, you know, all of the old stuff, a lot of the new stuff, plus they have a lot of toys and action figures. But then I started noticing all of the box systems that they have. Again, stuff that I normally don't see unless I actually go to a retro gaming expo. You know, a lot of expensive, kind of hard to find systems like the JVC 
XI, you have box Sega systems here. Now, I don't remember the last time I saw a box Turbo Duo, as well as, again, a Genesis CDX in the box, plus the, the Pladia. It's crazy. So that was really cool stuff to see. But then the owner came out and he's like, oh, dude, you have no idea. So he did a trade recently with a collector. I'm not sure who it was, but basically I believe it's a local collector who was trying to get rid of all of their handheld stuff. And he was like, do you want to just dig through the box? Of course I said yes, and I'm so glad I did because I was amazed at what I was seeing in here. I don't remember the last time I saw a sealed Gamecom handheld. I mean, this was wild to see. And as you see here, he's got a ton of sealed Gamecom games. And I was laughing because I was like, well, first of all, you know, this is not like a, I don't know, it's not like a popular handheld, but again, you know, to see, see them like this, I was just amazed how many games they had with it. Multiple versions of the handheld. I mean, this was just hilarious and it kept on going. This box here was really interesting because it was full of stuff you just rarely see, including this GCW Zero. New, never been even turned on before. So that's an emulation machine. It's an open source handheld. It's actually pretty cool. Check this thing out. It's called the Mega Duck. I'd never heard of this thing before. I guess it was made in Hong Kong, sold all around the world. It takes these cartridges. That was wild. It's like, I had never seen that before. But I gotta be honest with you. I mean, seeing all of these complete inbox cartridges for it was kind of tempting to jump on this. I mean, I don't know anything about it. It's probably crap. I'm assuming I have no idea, but to, to see a collection like this, you know, for sale is pretty cool. I didn't realize that there's so many licensed Gamecom games that came out for that handheld. I actually don't really know that much about the system other than it's pretty much universally hated, but to see a collection like this was pretty amazing. And then check out all of these Supervision games. Again, brand new, complete in their packaging. Now this is a system that I originally saw, I think John Hancock has one, but I don't know if he's actually got all of these games for it. This was a very funky competitor to the original Game Boy. Again, I don't think it was very successful in the United States, but as you can see here, they had a decent amount of games released for it. And again, as I go deeper into this bin here, I'm just blown away by all of the stuff that I have never seen before. <laughs> I mean, it's just wild to see all of this just sitting in a bin here. This is a massive trade. It, again, it was very cool to see. So that was a quick tour of Retro City Games, but that's only one of their two stores. They actually have another one that we're gonna check out here in a moment. And like I said, I did pick up some stuff and I'll show you what I got at the end of this video. Across town is the other location, and this one is actually part of a fairly upscale outdoor mall that has a lot of really nice stores around it. I mean, you see a lot of Audis and Porsches driving through here. So it's not something that you typically see with the retro gaming store. And then when you walk in, it's actually a bigger location. And you see here, it's got a bunch of games in the front, but then you also have a bunch of action figures and collectibles and pop culture stuff in the back there. And so this location definitely has a lot of variety going on here. I mean, they even have comic books and DVD movies and things like that. So they're definitely utilizing their space really well. Uh, the first thing that I noticed right off the bat up above there, they had an alien face hugger. This is like a full size like collectible that you could put in your game room. <laughs> Oh man, uh, that would be really cool to have in mind. A little bit more expensive than I probably would want to spend, but I did think that was really cool. Towards the front of the store, I noticed that they have a lot of import games. And this is the type of stuff I typically gravitate towards these days because you tend to find some really interesting stuff that maybe didn't come out in North America. Uh, I like seeing this type of stuff here, especially the PlayStation 1, the PSP games, stuff like that. I noticed that they had a decent selection of Sega Genesis games here, a lot of them boxed. There was a lot of titles here that I was like, oh man, it'd be cool to own those. In the back of the store, they had a bunch of early Atari stuff back there. And they told me that, hey, it normally doesn't look like this, but they're kind of moving some inventory around. 
But honestly, I don't mind when it looks like this. I think it's really fun to dig through it, try to find some stuff that maybe you've never seen before, kind of just get surprised a little bit. And I actually did find a couple Atari cartridges that I didn't have in the collection, so I had to pick them up. I do think that this store has more of the action figures and pop culture collectibles, and that's probably because they just have a bigger store here, and so it's easier for them to display it. Also, because it's part of the mall, I assume that they probably get a more casual customer coming in the door. Uh, I know my, my wife, she definitely preferred this store because that's kind of what she's into. She saw more things here that she would love to actually buy. So overall, this is a very cool store, but I do like the first location better because it just has more of the extremely uncommon stuff there, the stuff you just almost never see. But it's important to know that they do share inventory between stores. And if you happen to live closer to one than the other, you can always ask them about that. And usually they'll, they'll bring stuff from one store to another for you. So that's really nice. Later on that evening, we decided to check out Fremont Street. So if you're not familiar with Vegas, there is the famous strip, which has all the big casinos and hotels. But if you get a little bit outside of that, there is Fremont Street, which actually I think is even cooler. I mean, you know, you want to check out the strip, obviously, but down in Fremont Street, it's it's just a little bit more intimate. It's not quite as grand. And I believe it's actually the older part of Vegas. And I actually prefer it. And it's here where you'll see a lot of live bands, a lot of street performers, a lot of DJs, uh, a lot of walk-up restaurants, a lot of walk-up bars that you can attend. There's also clubs here. Again, it's very much like if you, you took the normal Las Vegas Strip and then just squeezed it down into a couple city blocks. And so a couple things to know about this is that yes, it is definitely more crowded here because it's more concentrated. Uh, and also it's definitely louder. As you see, this is my, my Apple Watch detecting loud noises. <laughs> It was giving me a decibel warning here because it was definitely loud. You know, of course, it's Vegas, right? So you're here, you're having a good time, anything goes. So it was definitely fun. Now, the first thing you're going to notice when you get here is that they have this massive LED ceiling that just runs most of the length of it. When I was here probably two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago, this wasn't complete. But to see it in action now, animating and changing all the time, it is so cool. It, it's, it's almost like sensory overload when you're just walking down the street because up above you, again, it's constantly changing. It's not just one type of thing. You know, as, as your time goes on, as the hours go on, you'll see all sorts of stuff in this, the ceiling. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. It's, it's cool. Also at one end of this is the Plaza Hotel and Casino, which should look pretty familiar to fans of Back to the Future 2. That was used to be Biff Tannen's hotel in that movie. And so that put a huge smile on my face because I love that movie. Next, we're gonna check out something that I've heard about for years now, and I'm happy to finally go there, is the Pinball Hall of Fame Museum. I love this because as you pull up, you see it has the word pinball there on the side of the building, as though you could see it from space. I mean, there is no question where you're going when you pull up and, and just park here. It's hilarious. And a lot of people have told me to check this out over the years. And, you know, I'll be honest with you, you know, I like pinball, but I'm not, you know, hardcore about it. And so I didn't know exactly what to expect, but I'll tell you what, this place did not disappoint because, well, for one, yes, it's an entire history of pinball and pinball machines, but also there are arcade games in here as well. And not just new ones and not just old ones. It really is across the gamut here. It's a little of everything. And what's great about this place, as you can see, it's absolutely massive. It's this huge warehouse and it's completely free to get into. So. That's why you see a lot of parents here with little kids because it's one of those places in Vegas where you can take the entire family here and have a really good time. Now, the way that this is run, it's completely volunteer based. And so the way that they make their money is simply either by donations or 
by playing pinball. So the pinball machines, to be fair, and the arcade machines, they're not set to free to play. You do have to pay to play them. They've got a little coin machine up at the front there. And so it ranges anywhere from a quarter to a couple bucks, depending on the machine and you know how new it is, how expensive it is. But that's how they make their money here. And so it's all volunteer based. As a matter of fact, you see a couple of them here maintaining and cleaning the machines. I thought this was pretty cool. So this is not some dusty museum that's just left to wither and die. It's it's well maintained. These are all really like great running machines here. I was very impressed. And the thing about pinball that I really enjoy is that it's a mix of electronics and mechanical. Actually, depending on how far back you go, Sometimes they're just 100% mechanical, right? And they've been slowly adding in some digital elements to these, all the way up to some of the brand new ones, like you see the Iron Maiden one here, uh, and everything in between. And so yeah, my wife and I had a ton of fun hanging out at the Pinball Museum here. And again, it's free to get into, and for five or $10, you can play a ton of stuff. You know, Vegas is actually pretty expensive normally. So I feel like this is one of the really reasonable things that you can do as a family. And again, just hang out for hours here. It's, it's awesome. After that, I want to do something maybe a little bit different, get out of the city a bit. And, you know, Las Vegas is a desert and it's surrounded by these beautiful hills that you can see off in the distance. And so, you know, I had a car, I was like, well, let's just go for a drive and let's check it out. And so what I ended up doing was going up to Red Rock Canyon, which is, you know, maybe 20 minutes outside of the city. But as you can see here, it's absolutely beautiful. In many ways, this kind of reminds me of the drier eastern side of Washington state. And so yeah, this was kind of a nice little diversion, nice little trip outside of the city. Heading back into town, not very far off of the strip is a place that Reggie told me to check out called A Gamer's Paradise. From the outside, this place might look kind of small, but once you walk in here, you realize that it goes way far back. And as you spend some time in here, you realize that there is some amazing stuff in here. This place blew my mind. Check this out. Towards the back, they have this small, compact, I guess you would call it like a, a computer gaming history museum. I mean, this thing, everywhere you look is something very uncommon, extremely hard to find. I was, again, just blown away by the stuff that they just had sitting on shelves here. This blue Game Gear, which I've never seen before. Check this out. You have the Atari Jaguar CD. They've got an Apple Pippin. That is the Apple gaming console that nobody bought. Here we have a boxed crystal pocket station from Sony, as well as multiple boxed end gauges, a Vectrex with the 3D imager goggles, Plus he's got a bunch of Nintendo stuff, including these game and watches, but check this out. He's got two test units for both the NES as well as the Super Nintendo. And then here's the sign that you would hang outside of your authorized repair center. How cool is that? And then he has these two authorized repair center manuals. Now this one right here is specifically for marketing and advertisement. So as we go through here, you see that it actually has the official information on how to recreate Mario. It even tells you exactly like the stencils to use, the logos, the colors, everything that you would need to actually officially, I guess, advertise your, your services. And then this one here is an official repair guide. So I guess you would use this to figure out what parts you need, but it also has information in here like how much it would cost for them to get the parts directly from Nintendo of America. Uh, it talks about the different colors, the official colors of pretty much everything that came out for all of the systems up to that point. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I mean, I'd love to sit down and just read both of these in their entirety. It was definitely a cool piece of history. And again, he's got it here in the store. He's also got a bunch of signed stuff in here as well. So for instance, you see here the Harlem Globetrotters on the NES. He had the entire team sign that. And then I thought this was amazing. So check this out. This is a vintage Star Trek pinball play field. 
that he has been able to have signed by many of the Star Trek actors across all of the different generations here. So basically he takes us to meet and greets that come through the Las Vegas area and he gets signatures on here and he's, man, he's got so many on this. This was, this is really cool to see. And then he's also got some signed Atari 2600 cartridges here. Yeah, it just goes on and on and on. Again, it's really cool because, you know, this is a fully functional retro gaming store that you can come in here and buy, but he's also got all of this stuff here that he's kind of collected over the last 20 plus years on display. So yeah, it was pretty amazing. And by the way, everything is for sale. So the owner of this place told me that, you know, he's kind of done. He's kind of done doing this retro gaming thing. He's been doing it for several decades and he's he, he's just ready to move on to his next phase of his life. And so right now the store is actually for sale. He's looking for someone to just come in and just buy it. If that doesn't happen, he's going to liquidate the entire inventory of it next year. So it's gonna be pretty interesting to see what happens with this store. I mean, I might be doing another trip down here next year to try to negotiate and pick up some of the weirder and kind of more collectible parts of this because yeah, like as you can see, he's just got some really cool stuff. So anyways, guys, that is my trip to Las Vegas, Nevada. I had a great time both on the strip, checking out Las Vegas, the city, but also doing some retro game hunting. And speaking of which, it's time to hop back on a plane, go back to cold and rainy Seattle. And uh, I think I need to show you what I picked up. Now, I didn't go completely crazy on this trip, but I did find some cool stuff, including Rings of Zelfin. This is an SSI RPG that came out in 1986. Now, what's cool about this game is that it's really designed to be kind of like a beginner's RPG. And uh, it was one I didn't have in my collection, and I do love these classic RPGs. I'm not sure what happened, but somehow I lost my original copy of Philosoma. This is a really cool shooter that came out on the original PlayStation, and I found a really clean copy of it here, so I picked up another one of that. Very cool game if you haven't checked it out. I believe I actually included this on like a Hidden Gems video a while back. As well as a bit of an unusual game here, this is called a VCS Tech Challenge. It's based on a, a game called Aztec Challenge that came out, well, I played it originally on the Commodore 64. I saw that somebody did a port of it to the Atari 2600. So I had to pick that up. And I suspect many of you picked up this Legend of Zelda Game & Watch that came out recently from Nintendo. While I was down in Vegas, one of the retro gaming stores had this in stock. So of course I had to pick it up and it's beautiful looking. And I'm continuing my quest for a complete Sony PSP game collection. You see another five games I found here. Again, nothing really super collectible. Thankfully, I have most of the expensive ones and these were all relatively cheap, as well as a couple more sports titles. And I'm laughing because again, this is the most sports titles I have for any other system and it's hilarious, but thankfully, all of these were like five bucks or less. I mean, they're super cheap. So again, it's not gonna hurt the wallet very much. And then a bit of a random buy here. I picked up Helsing on UMD video for the PSP. I picked this up simply because again, it was cheap, but also I absolutely love the Helsing anime. It's probably in my top 10 for sure. All right, well, that's my trip to Las Vegas, Nevada. And yeah, I had a great time, as you can see. Huge smile on my face. You know, you go down to Vegas, you're gonna have a good time. I mean, if you know what you're getting into, right? You know that you're gonna go down there and yeah, it's gonna be overwhelming. It's gonna be loud. It's gonna be this or that, but man, it is it is an awesome city. Uh, it's really cool having family that lives down there. So it's, you know, it's fun to go down there and see my mom, my aunt, my uncle, all that stuff. Uh, but then also do some retro game hunting. Hey, it's a good thing. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for subscribing and take care.